I'd like to welcome everyone once again to this month's Wildlife for Lunch webinar. This month's webinar is on threatened and endangered species on private land. It's going to be presented by Meredith Longoria, she's a conservation initiative specialist with the Non-Game and Rare Species Program at Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. This month's webinar is made possible through funding provided by the San Antonio Livestock Exposition Incorporated and it's hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Meredith, with that, I will pass the controls over to you. All right. And you should be good to go. All right. Well, good day, everybody, and thanks for choosing to spend your lunch hour with us. And I want to thank TWA for this opportunity to give this presentation today. This webinar series is a wonderful resource for the landowners of Texas, and I'm super excited to be a part of this. Let's see if I can get All right. A quick overview of this presentation. I'll give a brief history of the Endangered Species Act, covering some history and basic information about the act and how decisions are made about which species to list and when to delist them. I'll explain the difference between a threatened and endangered species listing under the act and the differences between state listed and federally listed species. I'll then cover some of the common misunderstandings and myths centered around the Endangered Species Act and highlight some of the successes of the Act before covering the tools available to private landowners provided through the Act. I'll wrap up discussing some of the recent proposed changes to improve the Act, as well as discuss the importance of proactive conservation and how that can be used to reduce the number of species listings in the future. Okay, first a little about the program that I work with at Texas Parks and Wildlife. The Wildlife Diversity Program is responsible for conservation management and rule recommendations for over 36,000 species of terrestrial non-game animals and plants. 99.05% of the terrestrial native plants and animals in Texas are classified as non-game, so our responsibilities are widespread. We coordinate with rare species biologists in the inland and coastal fisheries regarding rare freshwater and estuary species. Our programs are also responsible for implementation of the Texas Conservation Action Plan, which focuses on nearly 1,300 rare and important species, which, which we term species of greatest conservation need. Through project review, incentive program delivery, surveys and monitoring, conservation data management, technical guidance, and collaboration with many different partners, our focus is to prevent listing and promote recovery where possible, but most importantly, to conserve species for future generations. The goals of my position in particular include working with private lands biologists, rare species biologists, and other partners to assist you, the private landowners of Texas, with the implementation of conservation programs that benefit rare and at-risk species and communities. Also to include are also encouraging the use of proactive conservation tools that could help reduce the number of species that need state or federal protection, as well as assist with various other conservation programs and tools aimed at recovering listed species. I also work to assist with monitoring populations of species of greatest conservation need to provide the data needed to determine the best methods and programs for conserving those species and communities for future generations. Previously, before I started in this position approximately a year ago, I worked as a private lands biologist in Bastrop and Caldwell counties and gained lots of experience dealing with um, the Houston toad, which is a federally endangered species. Okay. All right, and now just to start with a brief history of the Endangered Species Act. The first piece of legislation leading to the Endangered Species Act we know today was the Endangered Species Preservation Act of 1966, which was prompted in part by the extinction of the passenger pigeon in 1914, the whooping crane population crash with only 21 estimated individuals documented in 1944, and the publication and popularity of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring book published in 1962 about the impact of pesticides on wildlife and people. This act provided a means for listing native and animal species as endangered, but only provided limited protection. Under this act, the departments of the interior, agriculture, and defense were to seek to protect listed species and preserve habitat for those species. 
and this act was authorized this act authorized us fish and wildlife to acquire land as habitat for endangered species Then Congress amended the 1966 Act to provide additional protection for species in danger of worldwide extinction, creating the Endangered Species Conservation Act of 1969, which prohibited the importation and sale of protected species without a permit and called for an international meeting to adopt a convention to conserve listed and in listed endangered species. 1973 was the big year for conservation. Congress passed the more robust Endangered Species Act of 1973 with overwhelming bipartisan support, 355 to 4 in the House of Representatives and a voice vote in the Senate, which was signed into effect by none other than President Richard Nixon. That year, 80 nations got together in Washington, D.C. and signed an international treaty, the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, also known as CITES which monitors and restricts international commerce in plant and animal species believed to be harmed by the trade. There are often negative responses to the Endangered Species Act, mostly in response to the federal government having a say in what a private landowner can or can't do with his or her property. However, the Federal Endangered Species Act is one of the best tools our country has to ensure that future generations will be able to enjoy the rich wildlife and biological heritage associated with the private lands that we love and that we cherish and benefit from in countless ways. It's not a perfect law, and we'll discuss some of the improvements that are currently underway. Also, I'd like to emphasize that as a result of the imperfections of the Act and the difficulties that it can impose on private lands operations, we'll best benefit ourselves and future generations by implementing conservation practices voluntarily for species before the need to protect them under the Act arises. All right, this is a very busy slide. However, it's representative of a very complex process for determining which species weren't listing or delisting. I think that providing a brief overview of this process is important in order to provide you with a better understanding of what you as landowners can do to prevent listing or to help recover a listed species. You'll notice the color coding box in the bottom left-hand corner. In particular, the green boxes represent areas where Texas Parks and Wildlife Department and others can provide data and other input to influence decisions. And the brown arrows show places in the process with Fish and Wildlife Service or the National Marine Fisheries Service making a decision to move to the next level or remove a species from the process. A bit later in this pro presentation, I'll elaborate on various steps within this process, so don't feel the need to take it all in at once because we'll go through it. So firstly, um, how listing is initiated. There's two different ways listing is initiated. Either Fish and Wildlife Service conducts an internal assessment of a species prompting a listing, or other agencies, organizations, citizens, etc., can file a petition for one species, or as has more recently occurred, petitions are filed for multiple species at once. A petition is simply a formal written request to list, delist, reclassify, or revise critical habitat for a species. There are certain elements and guidelines for what a petition must provide set forth by the services, and at minimum they must list the species, the biological issue or issues associated with that or those species, and should include support literature as well as contact information for the listing entity. As of recent, the services have proposed changing the requirements associated with the petitioning process to limit a petition to one species, and I'll explain a little bit more about why that is later in the presentation, and to consult with the state natural resource agencies and provide all relevant data to support the petition before filing the petitions with the service. After a petition is filed, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has approximately 90 days to the extent practicable to review the best available information on that species specifically taking into account historical and current numbers and distribution of the species overall or for a significant portion of its range, and any supporting publications, reports, or letters from authorities, as well as maps of distribution for that species or those species. That brings us to the Texas Natural Diversity Database, which is housed within Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, and it tracks approximately 1,100 species. 
The need for best available science when making listing determinations is one of the reasons that Texas Natural Diversity Database, NatureServe, and other natural heritage databases are highly beneficial for serving as a data repository for mapping and tracking species population trends over time. As a private landowner, you can help with providing data that contributes to the best available science by granting permission for researchers to collect location-specific plant and animal population data to be entered into the database to be used to make important listing or delisting decisions. Without your permission, the data cannot be used by Fish and Wildlife Service or made available to consultants to help developers avoid rare species and reduce their costs when making decisions about where to place transmission lines, pipelines, roads, etc. Also keep in mind that a lack of population data for a species can result in the perception that a species is more critically imperiled than it may actually be. As far as what constitutes best available science, the services prefer peer-reviewed scientific publications conducted through state-of-the-practice methods, pending publications, and other information from credible sources. Peer-acknowledged experts can also be consulted for best available science. The timelines associated with some of these processes may not allow for all available information to come forward, but the service must evaluate the quality of information that is available within that time frame and then make a determination. After the 90-day finding is complete, which as of late 90-day findings can take years because of the backlog of petitions and the limited funding and staff the services have for reviewing those petitions currently in their possession, a substantial or not substantial finding is made and is posted in the Federal Register so that the public has a chance to comment on that listing proposal for 30 days. If the finding is not substantial, no further action is taken. If the, if the finding is substantial, Fish and Wildlife Service continues with a thorough review of data and additional information about the species using the five-factor threat analysis. To determine whether the listing is warranted, the service conducts a five-factor threat analysis using the best available information on that species to determine, one, whether there is present or threatened destruction, modification, or curtailment of the species habitat or range, two, whether there is overutilization of the species for commercial, recreational, scientific, or educational purposes, three, disease or predation threats that threatens the species survival, and four, whether there are inadequate regulatory mechanisms in place to protect that species, and five, whether there are other natural or man-made factors affecting the continued existence of that species. If there's not enough data to warrant listing, then these then the species will not be listed and will be removed from the petitioning process. Twelve months after the petition is received, which again, as of late, 12 month reviews can take years because of the backlog of petitions, Fish and Wildlife Service is obligated to make a decision and publish their findings as not warranted, so no further action is taken, or warranted, and the species is then listed after posting on the Federal Register for a 30 day commenting period. Or, more commonly as of late, if there are other higher priority listing activities that preclude the listing of a species because resources are tied up and the 90-day process can't even begin, then a species may be a candidate for listing until a proposed rule can be prepared. <clears throat> and that candidate cycle, those candidate species get reviewed annually, but they can stay within that loop for quite a long time um, because of the backlog of petitions that are having to be processed. Candidate species are um, not regulated by the Fish and Wildlife Service as they are listed as candidates. And it doesn't mean that because a species is a candidate that it's inevitable that it will be listed. In fact, we've seen, con you know, contrary to that, um, dune sagebrush lizard didn't get listed. Um, and then annual evaluation again happens and is posted in the candidate notice of review each year, which is also made available to the public. And in that review, they rank the candidate species according to the risk. Okay. Um, and a little bit later, I'll discuss some of the tools available for candidate species conservation. So basically, identification of a candidate species and the threats affecting them provides an opportunity for environmental planning efforts through advance notice of potential listing, 
by jump-starting conservation efforts, giving landowners and resource managers a chance to alleviate threats and possibly conserve the species in its habitat so that listing becomes unnecessary. Once a listing determination has been made to list a species as endangered or threatened, Section 4D rules protect the listed species from importing or exporting from the U.S., from take, which I'll define later in the presentation, from possession, sale, transport, and purposeful destruction of the species. A threatened listing allows more flexibility for state natural resource management agencies to take, kill, wound, trap, or move, basically. And again, I'll define that more specifically in a slide in, in a few minutes. Um, a species in pursuit of conservation programs for, this, for that species. It offers increased flexibility also through special regulations that would not be possible if the species were listed as endangered, which becomes especially important in reducing species-human conflicts as a species approaches recovery and becomes more numerous and widespread. So under a threatened listing, permits can be issued to take individuals for zoological exhibition, educational purposes, or other special purposes under a threatened status. And threatened status also allows landowners to go about routine actions that might result in incidental take under the ESA, which I'll also elaborate on in the next slide. Under the Act, the definition of take is to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, or collect any threatened or endangered species or attempt to engage in such conduct also includes land use and water use activities as potential causes of wildlife take and, quote, significant habitat modification or degradation where it actually kills or injures wildlife by significantly impairing essential behavior patterns, including breeding, feeding, or sheltering, is included in this defini definition of take as well. So there's some habitat protection component in that definition of take. Incidental take means that an individual of a listed species is not intentionally killed or harmed, but accidentally or inadvertently harmed or killed during the course of conducting routine land management activities. Once a species is listed, critical habitat for that species is usually defined. Critical habitat is an area identified to contain the physical and biological features determined essential for the survival or recovery of that species. Critical habitat may also include areas that were not occupied by the species at the time the species is listed, but are deemed critical to the survival and recovery of that species, often taking into account historical range of that species. Critical habitat does not create a refuge, nor does it necessarily restrict development. It only impacts federal lands or lands where there is a federal nexus, such as the issuance of a federal permit or federal funding. This is mainly a tool to remind other federal agencies to consult with U.S. Fish and Wildlife if their actions may destroy or adversely modify critical habitat for a listed species. So basically they have to conduct a Section 7 consultation to ensure that they're not jeopardizing that species with their actions. A critical habitat designation does not necessarily restrict development or management actions on private property. It's a reminder to federal agencies that they must make special efforts to protect the important characteristics of these areas. Only activities that involve a federal permit, license, or funding are likely to destroy or adversely modify the area of critical habitat will be affected. If this is the case, the service will work with the federal agency and where appropriate, private or other landowners to amend the project to allow it to proceed without adversely affecting the critical habitat. Thus, most federal projects are likely to go forward, but some will be modified to minimize harm to the critical habitat. And there's a link at the bottom of that slide that will take you to an area where you can see where critical habitat has been designated for the various listed species. The whole purpose of the Endangered Species Act is to protect species from going extinct and increase numbers enough to recover those species to a point that they no longer need federal protections to ensure their continued existence. After a species is listed, a recovery team is formed to develop a recovery plan for most species. Public comment and inputs requested by posting a recovery plan online for a 90-day public commenting period. Most recovery plans target a single species and a single species recovery plan has shown to be more effective in preventing future decline and in reaching recovery goals than multi-species recovery plans. 
Recovery plans are reviewed every five years to assess recovery progress, the level of impact of ongoing threats, and incorporate any new information about the species. The five-year reviews are also made available to the public online, and there's a link where you can find them. I want to take a moment to elaborate on the differences in the level of protection offered to animals versus the limited protection provided to plants under the Act. Under Section 9 of the Endangered Species Act, it's illegal to kill an endangered animal without a permit, but not necessarily so for plants. They are protected from removal from possession of malicious damage or destruction to endangered plants on lands under federal jurisdiction, so federal properties or um, lands that are subject to a federal permit or are receiving federal funding. In some cases, endangered plants can be deliberately killed on private land without a permit or without mitigation, although I do not advocate doing so. Having rare plants on a property is indicative of the unique landscape and the quality of the land stewardship practices in place to support those rare plant populations. Voluntary protection on private land is particularly important to plants because many are found exclusively or predominantly on private land. And that's why it's critical that we work so closely with landowners to develop voluntary conservation agreements to protect endangered plants on private lands. Keep in mind if you're receiving federal funding or need a federal permit for carrying out an activity on your property, plants listed under the Endangered Species Act receive the same protections that they receive on federal land. Okay, and this is always a big question that I get about the difference between our state list of threatened and endangered species versus the federal list of endangered and threatened species. And they're regulated differently, um, and some of the definitions of take are different as well. Species, species listed as endangered or threatened by the federal act are protected by both federal and state law. The state of Texas also maintains a list of state threatened and endangered species that's intended to protect species in addition to those on the federal list that are thought to be threatened with extinction in Texas. There are some major differences in the level of protection that state listed species receive compared to federally listed species. First and foremost, habitat modification and degradation is not included in the state definition of take as it is under the Endangered Species Act. Fish and wildlife species that are state listed are protected by section 68.015 of the TPWD code that states that no person may take, possess, propagate, transport, export, sell, or offer sale or shipment of any species of fish and wildlife listed by the department as endangered or threatened. Take is defined in section 1.101, subsection 5 of the TPWD code as collect, hook, hunt, net, shoot, or snare by any means or device and include an attempt to take or to pursue in order to take. So again, nothing about habitat and those definitions of take. It's just um, harm to the purposeful harm to the species and incidental take as well. Penalties for take of listed species can result in class A, B, or C misdemeanors depending on prior convictions, but you would have to have you know evidence in place for that. There's no official mitigation option or recovery plan for state listed species at this time, although we're hoping to develop some um, as as there are for federally listed species. So. That's one of the benefits of dealing with a federally listed species is there are ways to mitigate for take, whereas there isn't under the state plan per se. The takeaway message here is that there's no federal regulations associated with state listed species and habitats not included in the definition of take. And if a species is on the state list, that provides landowners with the perfect opportunity to begin proactive habitat work to benefit those state listed species to keep them off the federal list. All right, now let's go over some of the common myths and misunderstandings now that you've got the basic idea of how the Endangered Species Act works and why it's in place. Um, critics of the Endangered Species Act often cite that only a handful of species protected by the act have ever recovered enough to be removed from the endangered species list. In particular, U.S. Representative Cynthia Loomis said in 2013, quote, we have a law where only 1% of the species have been listed, have actually been delisted. To me, that indicates a law that's failing in its ultimate goal, which is to list species, recover them, and delist them, end quote. 
If delisting were the only or even a primary measure for success of the, of the act, then this might be true. But as we all know, it takes time for a species to recover, and the majority of listed species have not been under protection long enough to warrant an expectation of recovery. On average, federal recovery plans estimated the length of time for a species to achieve recovery to be 42 years, while the majority of those species have only been listed for an average of 24 years. So you can see we've got some time. Again, the purpose of the act is to first prevent the extinction of America's most imperiled plants and animals, second, to increase their numbers, and thirdly, to achieve full recovery and removal from the endangered list. It's true that only 28% I'm sorry, 28 species have been delisted due to actual recovery since the act was established, but preventing extinction in the face of numerous ongoing threats is a difficult task that can take generations to accomplish. Getting species to the point where they no longer face extinction is very challenging and complex. The vast majority of plants and animals currently on the endangered species list are now stable or increasing in numbers and are no longer in decline. Success can be viewed as preventing a species from going extinct, being mindful of how we affect that species, and what we can do to prevent its extinction and to help it recover to the point that it no longer needs protection. A few numbers that serve as indicators of its success include the 99% success rate of preventing extinction since the passage of the Act in 1973. Only one half of 1% of species placed on the list have become extinct, and most of those were extinct by the time they were listed, which works out to a success rate of 99% plus. 93% of the listed species populations have stabilized or increasing in numbers since they were listed, and the Act has shown a 90% recovery rate in more than 100 species throughout the U.S. More than half of all listed species populations are stable or improving, and that percentage increases with the amount of time that they've been under protection. And the Act has had an 82% success rate in meeting the projected recovery timeline for species with designated recovery plans. In addition, the Act has allowed the designation of millions of acres of critical habitat and critical habitat designation for a listed species has shown to increase the likelihood of survival and recovery of that species under the Act. It's important to keep in mind that the Act works as an emergency room for imperiled species. By the time species are listed, their numbers are so low that preventing extinction is the first major challenge. According to research conducted by the Center for Biological Diversity on the successes of the, of the Endangered Species Act, only 10 species protected under the Act have been declared extinct, and of those, eight were likely extinct before they were protected. Scientists estimate another 227 species would likely have gone extinct since the passage of the law without the law to protect them. While most listed species have not yet achieved full recovery, their recovery goals have been increasing dramatically for most listed species, and here are a few examples. The whooping crane population has increased by more than 1,009% since it was listed in 1967. The black-footed ferret population has increased range-wide by more than 8,280% since it was listed in 1987. Kemp's Ridley sea turtle populations have increased more than 19,800% since the time of their listing in 1979. A couple of federally listed endangered plant species, including Johnson's Frankinia and black lace, black lace cactus. So black lace is there on the left, and Johnson's Frankinia is all that stuff flagged in that right picture, are both candidates for delisting in large part thanks to the successful partnership between private landowners and researchers that have provided for data collection, as well as good habitat management. This is an excellent example of how private landowners play a very large role in influencing listing decisions at the federal level through excellent land stewardship practices and a willingness to share critical data. Eighty percent of all federally listed species have not reached their expected recovery year. On average, they've only been listed for 32 years, while the recovery plans projected 46 years of listing needed to reach those recovery levels. Species with dedicated recovery plans with a funding source to facilitate and incentivize habitat management and conservation activities 
are significantly more likely to lead to the recovery of the listed species within the projected timeline and eventual delisting. Of all species that have been listed under the Act as threatened or endangered, 56 have been delisted in total, of which 28 have achieved full recovery status, 10 were removed due to extinction, and 8 of those 10 were likely extinct by the time they were listed, and 18 were delisted for a variety of other reasons, including taxonomic revision or discovery of new information. So how many species should have recovered by now? The Center for Biological Diversity compared the actual recovery rate of 110 listed species with the projected recovery rate and found that 90% of species are recovering at the rate specified by their federal recovery plan. Many species are near or above the numeric population goal set by their recovery plan and will likely be delisted in the next 10 to 15 years. And many will not be delisted for many decades because the recovery plans require much more time to fully secure their fate at those numbers. Another common misunderstanding is that listing species gives biologists job security. You know how many people are just chomping at the bit to get a degree in biology these days since it's such a lucrative business, or conservation groups and biologists just want money from the government. In actuality, several lawmakers in recent years have introduced bills that would make it illegal for environmental groups to receive economic gain from filing lawsuits under the Endangered Species Act. Environmental groups that file lawsuits have to pay court costs just like anyone else, which is not cheap. A 2009 study by the State Bar of Texas found that the average nonprofit lawyer earned an annual salary of $83,000, about half of what corporate attorneys made that year. As for wildlife biologists, the average annual salary in Texas for biologists is $53,000 a year, which is 15% below the natural, natural, national average salary. Endangered Species Act is hardly the path to riches, folks. Another myth is that it kills jobs and harms the economy. Many people say that the Endangered Species Act is bad for economic growth. A healthy economy and a healthy environment go hand in hand. <clears throat> a successful conservation plan that has a chance to protect an at-risk species ensures that both the species conservation needs are met and economic development needs are met. It may require people or businesses to modify their behavior, but it doesn't mean that all economic growth will come to a stop. We have almost 1,500 listed species in this country, yet we still have a growing population with the highest standard of living in the world. Numerous research papers have countered the claims that the Endangered Species Act kills jobs. Stephen Myers in his 1995 paper, The Economic Impact of the Endangered Species Act on Agricultural Sector says, the assertion that the Endangered Species Act has harmed the American farmer, hobbled agricultural production, and decimated the forest industry is baseless. He also wrote a paper titled The Economic Impact of Endangered Species Act on the Housing and Real Estate Markets, in which he wrote that, Analysis of timber prices, timber production, housing construction, housing prices, and real estate industry performance shows that the Endangered Species Act has not burdened state real estate markets or the home building industry. According to another study on economic effect of the endangered species preservation in the non-metropolitan West, which looked at a cross-section of 333 non-metropolitan counties in the western U.S., there's no evidence of any relationship between the number of listed species and job growth. Not only is the Endangered Species Act not a job killer, it's actually helped promote more sustainable management and a vital natural resource across the country. Also remember, a healthy economy and a healthy environment go hand in hand. Many Texans depend on recreational opportunities for their livelihoods, and as of recent, that includes ecotourism. And by taking action to protect our native fish, wildlife, and plants, we can better ensure a healthy future for our communities and for our future generations. My tax dollars are being wasted on species that I'll never see. How is that fair? When the Endangered Species Act was passed in 1973, Congress determined that these species of fish, wildlife, and plants are of aesthetic, ecological, educational, historical, recreational, and scientific value to the nation and its people. These species are an important part of our nation's rich biological treasure. Endangered species depend on clean air, water, and a healthy environment just as we do. Protecting these species and their habitats provide value even if you never see them. Everything's connected. 
Just because we can't see an obvious direct connection to us doesn't mean one doesn't exist. These species are indicators of the health of the environment in which we live and a reflection of how we care for the habitat in which they live or once lived. Biology is not a concrete science. For every biologist that believes a species is in trouble, there's another who knows the species is doing just fine. Yes, biologists may have different interpretations of species status. That's why the, Act, the Endangered Species Act process includes opportunities for people to provide different viewpoints. The listing process provides the public commenting period several times during the listing process, including when a listing rule is proposed, it is posted to the Federal Register for a 60-day public commenting period. Keep in mind, listing decisions are based on best available science. By working with researchers and state natural resource agencies to allow population surveys for rare species and providing permission for location-specific data to be collected from private property, you, the landowner, can contribute to the quality and quantity and accuracy of the best available science used for making better informed listing decisions, as well as contribute to documenting population response to conservation actions after a species is listed to help with documenting its recovery status. If an endangered species is found on my property, the government will take away my land or can access my land whenever they want. Better to shoot, shovel, and shut up. The presence of a listed species on your property does not stop projects or activities from happening on your land and does not grant access to your land by federal employees. Permission for access must be requested and granted. It's up to a landowner to voluntarily contact Fish and Wildlife Service to understand how to best protect or even enhance habitat for the listed species. You can also contact Texas Parks and Wildlife Department as well. If you find an endangered species on your land, it means that the habitat is healthy enough to support a rare species and you may get to observe a plant or animal that few other people have the opportunity to see. You also can take pride in your land stewardship practices because not everybody has been able to maintain their, their land in such a good condi condition to allow for that species to be there. Presence of an endangered species does not stop projects or activities from happening on your land and does not give anyone else a right to enter your property without your permission. Blatantly destroying habitat or purposely harming, harassing, or killing an endangered species can result in fines. This is why it's good to understand ways to minimize harm to an endangered species if you have one on your land. So be informed. Work with your local TPWD or Fish and Wildlife Service biologist to understand how to best protect or even enhance habitat for the listed species and to learn about which tools provided under the Act would benefit you the most. You might find that you're eligible for funding sources to improve habitat for that species as well as a suite of other species that you wouldn't otherwise be eligible for if it were not for the presence of that endangered species or its critical habitat. The Fish and Wildlife Service controls private property and thwarts important land use and development projects. A general accounting office study of 18,211 consultations by the Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries Service showed 89% of these projects allowed businesses and property owners to operate without any intervention. Most consultations were handled informally. The Fish and Wildlife Service found only 181 projects, that's less than 1%, to present a risk to the species. Nearly all of the 181 projects were able to move forward after collaboration with Fish and Wildlife Service. They are willing to work with you. You just have to contact them. Out of 429,533 development projects considered under the Endangered Species Act between 1998 and 2004, less than 1% were halted, and all but one of these projects were implemented after modifying the project to address concerns about the listed species. The one project that was halted was the Fish and Wildlife Service's own translocation program for southern sea otters. This is one of my favorite quotes from the father of wildlife management, Aldo Leopold. The outstanding scientific discovery of the 20th century is not television or radio, but rather the complexity of the land organism. Only those who know the most about it can appreciate how little we know about it. The last word in ignorance is the man who says of an animal or a plant, what good is it? If the land mechanism as a whole is good, then every part is good, whether we understand it or not. If the biota in the course of eons has built something we like but do not understand, 
then who but a fool would discard seemingly useless parts? To keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. All right, now quickly, I would like to go over some of the um, tools available to private landowners offered through the Endangered Species Act to help landowners to accomplish their goals when endangered species are concerned. Section 10 offers enhancement of survival permits, incidental take permits, special 4D rules for threatened species, and for experimental populations. It authorizes activities that would otherwise be prohibited under the Act. The service can issue permits that allow limited take of listed species for scientific purposes or to enhance the propagation or survival of a species. These permits are usually issued to university researchers, conservation organizations including zoos, botanical gardens and aquariums, and or private landowners with conservation plans. Special rules that allow for more management flexibility may be developed through special 4D rules for threatened species to exempt, exempt some activities from Section 9, which is take. Under Section 10J, experimental populations are generally treated as proposed species, even if the species is listed as, listed as endangered. We don't have a whole lot of experimental populations in Texas um, that we utilize that for just at this time. Section 10 includes all of those exceptions there, and then I will elaborate a little bit more on some of Section 10. So Section 10A1A is enhancement for survival permits which are provided through safe harbor agreements and candidate conservation agreements with assurances. Enhancement of survival permits authorize limited take to private property owners who participate in voluntary conservation agreements, including safe harbor agreements or candidate conservation agreements with assurances that provide conservation benefits to listed or candidate species. Both of these authorize limited take and are issued to private property owners who agree voluntarily to participate in a mutually agreed upon conservation plan. Um, in both of these voluntary conservation agreements, landowners are provided with assurances that no additional actions beyond those spelled out in their agreement will be required if the population of the species and quality of habitat increases as a result of their actions. So a common fear on private lands is why should I do something to benefit habitat for a species if it means that I'm just going to be held to further restrictions. Well, this is a way of alleviating that concern. There are two tools available through Section 10A1A and 10A2B. Candidate conservation agreements with assurances um, is for landowners. The other is between federal entities. Um, these involve a plan or an agreement with measures to address threats to a species on both federal and non-federal lands and the specific conservation measures and efforts to be implemented to address those threats. It has an typically the agreement will have an implementation schedule, a description of anticipated effects on the covered species um, or any proposed species that's a candidate, and a monitoring plan with a reporting process. So if that species is to become listed in the future, um, that landowner is protected from further restrictions other than what they've already agreed to within that conservation candidate, candidate conservation agreement with assurances. And we had some of those in place for the lesser prairie chicken before it was listed as threatened. And as a result, that's probably why it was listed as threatened instead of endangered because of the conservation agreements that were already being implement, implemented. Habitat conservation plans are tools for conserving listed, proposed, and candidate species while providing for development that will not appreciably reduce the likelihood of the survival or recovery of the species in the wild. These incidental take permits can only be issued to non-federal entities provided an approved HCP is developed and implemented. HCPs require monitoring, minimizing, and mitigating the impacts of any incidental taking of the listed species, and any incidental take cannot appreciably reduce the likelihood of the survival and recovery of the species in the wild. HCPs also come with an additional benefit called no surprises. Once an H HCP permit has been issued, and as long as a permitted activity is not jeopardizing the listed species, the services may not require the commitment of additional funding or resources from the HCP participant. So that's the no surprises part. 
It ensures that a developer knows the cost and acreage devoted to Endangered Species Act purposes and the resource commitment cannot be increased. The purpose of HCPs is to ensure that there's adequate minimizing and mitigating of the effects of the authorized incidental take. It authorizes incidental take of illicit species, not the activities that result in the take. Um, it c there can be individual HCPs or HCPs that are held by entities such as counties or groups that hold the HCP for a multi-county area. As long as a participant in the HCP agrees to follow the guidelines, they're covered by that incidental take for the activities that are outlined in the plan. No surprises assurances for private landowners ensures that Fish and Wildlife Service will not require the commitment of additional land, water, or financial compensation or additional restric restrictions on the use of the land, water, or other natural resources beyond the level otherwise agreed to in the HCP without the consent of the permittee. So the big differences between HCPs and safe harbor agreements, um, habitat conservation plans um, ensure that species will be conserved and contribute to recovery and agree to minimize harm and mitigate impacts of take, whereas safe harbor agreements agree to actions that will actively contribute to the recovery. Um, and their assurances are no land use restrictions and no additional management actions. Um, and they can return to baseline or how their property was at the time they signed up for the agreement at the end of the agreement period and are provided incidental take coverage under the safe harbor agreement. Conservation banking is a market-based enterprise that offers financial incentive to landowners to protect threatened or endangered or even candidate species in their habitat. Fish and Wildlife Service determines the number of credits the bank owner may sell based on their management actions and benefit to the species of interest and developers who need to compensate for unavoidable adverse impacts or to mitigate for their actions uh, may purchase mitigation uh, credits basically from the, from the landowner. So the Corps of Engineers also has a similar program and works with landowners to create mitigation banks in a similar manner. Your most powerful tools available to you are being proactive in habitat management, managing at the ecosystem level to benefit as many species as possible, and in doing so, preventing the need to further, further, further regulate uh, through the Endangered Species Act. Be aware of those species that are currently under review for listing. There's a list of those on uh, our Parks and Wildlife website and also on the Comptroller's, uh, Texas Comptroller Public Accounts, Texas First um, website, and I'll have references to those here towards the end of the presentation. So work with your local biologists and natural resource professionals to implement management practices and design conservation plan, plans for those species to hopefully, to hopefully preclude the need to list them. Tools currently available include the Candidate Conservation Agreement with Assurances, and soon to come, there's a new federal policy being developed to incentivize active conservation management for species before they're listed. So there'll be something similar to the conservation banking um, in where a landowner will receive credits for their actions that benefit these species before they're listed and can then sell those credits um, in the future or use them themselves if that species is ever to be listed to mitigate for incidental take. Um, there's some other tools available to landowners through the Landowner Incentive Program. We're working on allocating a funding source through the Landowner Incentive Program that will assist landowners with implementing habitat improvements that benefit species listed under the Texas Conservation Action Plan as species of greatest conservation need. And we hope to have that funding in place sometime next fiscal year. But currently, there's two other pots of money that are available through the Landowner Incentive Program. And um, one of them is funded through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Partners Program. And it's a watershed series. And then there's another one for Conserving Texas Rivers series that um, is uh, targeting specific rivers of Texas or watersheds in Texas. So visit our Landowner Incentive Program website 
you can just Google that online and it should take you directly there to learn more about those programs. Working closely with TPWD biologists to document, document conservation efforts and habitat management practices can assist with providing the best available science to influence listing decisions. You can help by providing permission for location-specific data to be documented in the Texas Natural Diversity Database for populations that occur on your property. We are getting tight on time, I see. Um, so I'm going to skip a little bit about the Texas Natural Diversity Database. I do encourage you to, um, to visit the website. There's one specific to the Texas Natural Diversity Database that will explain that particular database and how it works. And I want to take you to probably the most um, important slide with the most questions related to private lands, and that's dealing with confidential data. So basically, as a landowner, if you allow someone to conduct from Parks and Wildlife to conduct research on your property, you have to sign that form that we looked at just a second ago, is I, that one. And you can choose location-specific or non-location-specific. If you choose non-location specific, that data is then marked as confidential. There's a field that's checked so that that data is filtered out before any request for information can be answered by our database team. Oftentimes, energy companies are looking for areas to install new CRES lines or transmission lines or pipelines or areas to put new roads and request data to minimize their costs for a specific project area to avoid um, these areas with sensitive species. And if that data is not available to them, it looks like areas depicted as white space, um, which are to them the most cost-friendly places to develop. Um, so if you happen to have a rare species on your property and it's not documented as location-specific, that data is not available to them. So they don't see it and they may end up um, not avoiding that spot when they could have. So again, I encourage you to visit our website on that. And this website that's listed at the bottom will show you what is already readily available online regarding documented rare species habitat that's searchable by county. So the number of species listed in the future is something we have control over. Partnerships between private landowners and biologists can play a critical role in gaining better science to avert listings and through implementing voluntary conservation practices to benefit at-risk species before the need for federal listing arises. So by working together, um, if you have species of greatest conservation need on your property or even a federally listed species on your property, we can find programs that will best suit you to help you accomplish your goals while at the same time adding to the conservation work being done to help document that conservation work to go into listing or delisting decisions. I'll be heavily involved in helping to develop a federal program to be administered at the state level that will provide incentives for landowners to voluntarily implement conservation practices to benefit rare or at-risk species that are not currently protected by the Act. So stay tuned for more information on this voluntary pre-listing conservation action policy. In the meantime, keep up the good land stewardship and take advantage of the tools provided to you. And I've got a resource page here, and we'll come back to that. Um, while I'm looking at questions and answering questions that you might have. And then also my contact information is here. If you would like to reach me, if you have any questions that don't get answered um, during this presentation, feel free to contact me or if there's any way that I can help you. And with that, um, that's pretty much the end of my presentation. Thanks, Meredith. Uh, I wanted to let everybody know that I did just post up from the previous page all those links. Uh, I just posted them up into the chat window, those resources there. So they're in the chat, chat window now. They should be a clickable link if you want to follow those. And I will leave that up, <coughs> excuse me, so we can access the chat window long after we, we close the webinar down. Uh, we've had a few questions come in that I wanted to get to. Uh, looks like only three of them so far. We still have a few minutes, so if anybody wants to continue to ask questions, post them up in the chat window and we'll get to all of them we can.
The first, first question asks, are you aware of any species whose populations either increased or decreased, possibly to the point of no longer being threatened or becoming extinct while working their way through the fish and wildlife listing process? Okay, take me to, is that in the chat window? Is that where you're getting that question? It was from question and answer, uh, so you may not be able to see it there. So basically, while an animal has been going, or, or an organism has been going through the listing process, do you know of any examples that it sat in the listing process long enough that it either became extinct or was no longer needed to be listed? Um, there have been instances where it's been in that limbo area for long enough that conservation actions were put in place that were successful enough that it no longer needed to be listed, but I don't know of any examples of it going extinct during that period. Okay. Um, the next says, Fish and Wildlife does not have the best reputation for pursuing and prosecuting violators of the ESA. Does Parks and Wildlife do any better with regards to enforcement when it comes to state listed species? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I don't really have a good answer for that. I know that our law enforcement is it does enforce our state listing state listed species regulations. However, um, they're typically not as stringent of regulations as there are under the in, the Endangered Species Act. So, yeah, if somebody's blatantly killed a, an animal that's listed on our state list, there there can be pen, penalties, and there have been. Um, but it's always investigated on a case by case basis. And you know, Texas is a big state, and somebody's got to call law enforcement in if they suspect something, and that doesn't always happen. So. I don't know if that answered that question very well or not. I think that, that covers it. Uh, if there's any more specifics to, to the person that posted that up, feel free to contact one of us and we can dive a little deeper into that. Um, the next question, what recommendations do you have for private landowners who want to manage their properties to benefit not only endangered species but all species in general? Okay, my recommendation is if you have species that are listed on your property or are in an area where it's possible that they could be there and we just don't know, um, and you want to manage for species other than that species, that is an opportunity for you because typically there's more funding available to assist with habitat management efforts. And when you're managing for an endangered species, it typically benefits more than just that species as you go through your conservation actions. So what I'm saying is that the rare species on your property may make available to you um, cost share monies that may not be available to you if you didn't have those rare species on your land. And then as you go about your conservation actions to improve habitat for those rare species, it's going to benefit the other species that you may be more interested in. Okay, and the last question we have for now, if a seller does not disclose, how can you research if the property is subject to any of these agreements or plans? Uh, that's a real good question because I've heard of multiple cases where people have not been informed or that information is not disclosed when they buy a property. You can search um, a couple different websites. So um, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department's Non-Game and Rare Species Program website you, there's a link in the left-hand corner um, that will take you to search for listed species by county. So you can start there by county, and then I would recommend doing a little homework on your own by calling your local wildlife biologist. There's also a Find Your Wildlife Biologist link on our website, and they will know uh, most likely whether or not, they'll know the areas where we've got listed species um, and can help you make an informed decision about whether you're in critical habitat or not. There's also another website on U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services web page, and I don't think I have it up there, where you can search for critical habitat as well as through our Texas Natural Diversity Database and our Wildlife Habitat Assessment Program websites through Texas Parks and Wildlife where you can search also for uh, rare species and critical habitat 
to help you identify whether your land that you're looking at purchasing is in one of those protected areas or one of those areas that's designated with critical habitat. Okay, we'll take one more question. Uh, Any other questions? Somebody just posted. Oh. Yep. Can you hear me, Meredith? I wonder if we timed out because I'm not hearing anything. I don't know. Um, Can you hear me now? Let me see if I see Hello? any other questions. So yeah, on the hey, chat window there, there are some links to some other websites. Um, the tpw.texas.gov slash GIS slash R test would be a place where you could find um, critical habitat designations across the state. And that's through our wildlife habitat assessment program. Uh, and the IPAC website also that allows you to input project-specific information. Thank you for ever put that on there. Donna, thank you. Hey, Meredith, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Oh, okay. I don't know where I went, but I was gone there for a minute. Um, so, yeah, we had a, a few few things that were posted up on the chat window. I appreciate you all posting those links. I uh, have one more question I wanted to run by you, and um, then I had another link to post it myself. This gentleman asked, how can I get official documentation of a currently listed threatened species that exists only on my land? And he says that it is the Cascade Caverns salamander. I'm sorry, could you, is that in the, I don't see that. It's in the question and answer panel. How can oh. I get official documentation of a currently listed threatened species that exists only on my land? I would work with Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, or, hmm, that's a good question. If it occurs only on your land and that's the only place that species exists and you want official documentation that it exists there, you need to work with somebody who can document that and put it in uh, a NatureServe based database um, for that official documentation. So I would either contact our state herpetologist, Andy Glusenkamp, to help with that, or you can also contact the Austin Ecological Field Services Office, um, which has uh, responsibility for salamanders in the Hill Country area. Okay, and I believe the gentleman said that he was going to email you, so uh, you may be able to direct him to the right people.